All right, so we'll continue with the appendicular skeleton and now the pelvic girdle in the lower extremity. So the pelvic girdle is two hip bones, which is the coxal bones plus the sacrum. Now the hip bone itself is called the os coxae, and that's the ilium, ischium, and the pubis there. So here's the iliac crest. So you can feel your hip bones there. Here's the iliac fossa. Here's the sacrum. Here's the SI joint, sacroiliac. Okay. Here's the anterior superior iliac spine. And here's the anterior inferior iliac spine. Okay. So if you, I know they're not in fashion anymore, but those low rise jeans used to sit between your ASIS and AIIS. They were designed right through there. Okay. So the ischium has the body in the ramus, which is right here, and the pubis is right in here, superior ramus, inferior ramus, and the pubic symphys, which can separate during childbirth. If you look at the shape of the pelvis, this is actually a male's. You'll see more of a heart-shaped pelvis, narrow, whereas a female pelvis is wider and will have more of an oval-shaped. Pelvic girdle is formed by a single hip bone, the hip bone attaches the lower limb to the exoskeleton through its articulation with the sacrum. The right and left hip bones plus sacrum and coccyx together make the pelvis. All right. So here's an image of a male versus female pelvis. If you look at the male pelvis, again, it's more heart-shaped. And the female is more oval-shaped. If you look at that pubic arch on a female, it's going to be 90 degrees, greater than 90 degrees. For men, it's going to be less than 60 degrees. So men's pelvises in general are narrower. So women's pelvises are naturally wider for childbirth. Okay, And the sacrum concavity, if you look at the sacrum, it comes in, whereas the sacrum for women will be out a little bit so that the nine pound baby can squeeze right through there okay so again you got to think all about childbirth you want a baby to go through this or you want a baby to go through that hopefully that or else your baby's gonna have a weird looking head if it goes through that and this is why i don't skateboard or snowboard this is skateboarding fractured humor uh, i'm sorry femur fractured pelvis fractured uh, yeah, sacrum. There's, you get, there's got a lot of a lot of issues here. Now here's the key, though. Is this a male or a female? You'd be surprised, right? So if you look at this, this is a nice oval shaped. Okay, nice oval shaped. So you're thinking, is it oval shaped because of what? No. This looks narrow, but if you look at this, if you look at the pubic arch, right, it's greater than 90, its pelvic outlet is oval. So this is a female, female skateboarder, All right? There we go. Females, you got to be careful. So again, here's the hip bone, iliac crest, iliac spine, ischium, this is what you're sitting on, on your butt. And the ischial tuberosity is where a lot of hamstrings attach. The pubis is here. The acetabulum is the hip socket. Obturator foramen. Okay. You can see if your hips are shifted by when you take a radiograph to see how open this obturator foramen is. Can you Are the holes even or is one side more closed than the other? So you can tell if your hip bones are shifted. Okay. The right hip bone here because you can't see the acetabulum, so you know the femur is lateral to this. So here's the iliac fossa, here's the ASIS, AIIS, here's the posterior, because you see the ant. Okay, so you gotta orient yourself and say, is this a right or a left? <clears throat> Again, just to reiterate, male versus female, the female pelvis is adapted for childbirth and is broader with a large subpubic angle here. What's the comparison of male versus female? General appearance, males are more massive, females less massive. Tilt, upper end of pelvis, upper end of pelvis tilted forward, 
depth of pelvis, pelvic inlet, heart versus round, subpubic angle, and you're like, Patel, do I need to know this? Yes, you need to know this. You definitely need to know the difference between male and female pelvis. Um, so study this section here, and that will definitely help you. Okay, again, the male is more robust, narrower, deeper, small pelvic inlet and outlet. Female adapted for childbirth, wider, shallower, larger <clears throat> pelvic inlet and outlet. The lower limb, there's four regions with 30 bones, the femoral region, thigh, the femur, and the patella. You've got the cruel leg region, which is the knee to ankle. So remember, when you use the terminology, leg means knee to ankle. Thigh is from femur or hip to patella. Your ankle is your tarsal region and your foot. So use this terminology correct, just like what we talked about uh, before. <clears throat> so here's the femur and the patella. This is a right femur. So here's the fovea capitis. Here's the head, the neck. Here's the greater trochanter, intertrochanteric line, lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle, and here's the kneecap. So the proximal end, which is closest, okay, head for the acetabulum. You got the trochanters. And try to memorize this because this is, again, where the muscles attach. If you know the features on the bones now, when we study the muscles, it'll be a lot easier. On the posterior aspect, there's the linea aspier, gluteal tuberosity. So what muscle do you think attaches here? One of the glutes, right? Here's the popliteal surface, probably a muscle named the popliteus might go here. So some of these features are named depending on which muscle is also uh, in relationship to it. And here's the patella, which is the kneecap. Ooh, yeah, this this no good. Leg, ACL, MCL, tibia, fibula. Okay. Here's the tibia and the fibula. <clears throat> this is your shin. This is your leg. This is your fibula, which is a non-weight-bearing component. So tibia has condyles and a tuberosity. Fibula has a head. Shaft of the tibia, which is the shin, is the anterior border. Distal ends, media has a tibia has a medial malleolus, and the fibula has a lateral malleolus. Okay. This is your shin. This is your leg. Oh yeah, I showed you this picture before, so no warning there, but that is his tibia. But look at that. Oof, that's no good, man. That's So that's uh, the tibia and the fibula are pretty much, uh, yeah, that, that just gives me the heebie-jeebies looking at that. All right, we'll switch. Okay, the ankle and the foot, calcaneus and the heel. You have the talus, which is the most superior, navicular, medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms. You've got the metatarsals, numbered one through four, uh, medial to lateral. You've got the phalanges, bones of toes. You've got the great toe, two bones. You've got the three bones and all others, and two to four. So, again, looking at the foot, you want to know which bones are articulate with what, meaning what do they join with, what does the calcaneus do, where's the talus, where's the navicular. And look at that. That looks nasty. Yes, that is his tibia, pretty much, where he's just kicked him right out of there. And that, I mean, soccer is bad news, guys. And those that play soccer, you you know. Okay. So here's the foot. Here's the talus. Here's the cuboid. Here's the navicular. If you have flat feet, your navicular will drop. Okay. Tuberosity of calcaneus. Metatarsal 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You've got the phalanx, and you've got the distal phalanx. Okay. So remember, in the hand, it's called metacarpals, but in the foot, are called metatarsals. So here's the phalanges, metatarsals. Here's the navicular. Again, if you have flat feet, it's going to drop. Talus. Here's the calcaneus. Okay. The arches of the foot, you have a medial longitudinal arch, which is the heel to great toe. You have a lateral longitudinal arch, which is heel to little toe. Uh, transverse arch includes the cuboid, cuneiforms, and proximal heads of the metatarsals. And the bones of the foot. So when we talk about feet, we always talk about shoes. We talk about arches. So let's look at some 
shoes that I think are pretty good as far as what they provide stability. I know that they probably don't look the greatest, uh, um, they, but they are some good shoes out there. So let's take a look at the 2020 lineup. But before we do that, <laughs> remember, if you wear shoes that don't fit properly, so remember when the Chinese used to bind their feet? This is what it looks like. So if your shoes are too small, or if their shoes are uh, not the correct size, or if one shoe is too big and the other one's too small, you're going to get deformities. You're going to get bunions. You're going to get toes that look all funky. If you start to wear high heels a long time, you, this is what it's going to look like. So, you know, we're the only culture that wears shoes all the time, and that's why we have the most messed up feet. So... Ladies, uh, do you really want to wear, oop, that should be wear, high heels, okay. Um, that's what your foot looks like in an x-ray or a radiograph. That doesn't look even anatomically correct, right? But you're like, Patel, you look good in these. I know, but look at all the torque that you're putting on there. So the pressure on a three-inch heel is 76%. Two-inch heel is 57% and one-inch heel is 22%. So the higher the heel, the more pressure there is in the front of the foot, percentage increase, which can cause ankle injuries, ball of the foot pain, the pump bump, also known as Haglund's deformity. This is a bony enlargement on the back of the heel. You can get Achilles tendon shortening. You can get Achilles tendon uh, ruptures. Uh, and the way you would get a rupture is, okay, You've been wearing high heels all the time, your Achilles tendon shortens, and then when you go play basketball or when you try to go play sports, it's too tight and you go cut and pivot, and then bam, it tears that way. So that's how it, that can occur. All right, so let's look at some tennis shoes. So here's the shoes that I recommend, and this is based on PRI, which is postural restoration, which I've taken many classes for. There's a lot of research based on this. So if you have a relatively high arch, so you have a pretty firm midfoot, then the A621 or the A6 Cumulus, which are these, uh, I'm sorry, these are Brooks, Brooks 12. Um, it's hard to find A621s. Don't get the 22s because they, they're not the same. Um, but the A6 Cumulus 21, it's a good looking shoe, but here's the Brooks Ghost 12, it's a good looking shoe. Then um, there's also the Brooks Levitate or the New Balance 880 of these like the Brooks, but again, you know, people always call these old man shoes or old woman shoes. So you have to go with style, all right? But if you like any of these, there's different styles, there's different colors, just go on Zappos and check out all these, but they're not cheap. They're all over 150 bucks, okay? So that's for high arches, if you have really high arches. If you have an average looking arch, then my favorite is the A6 Nimbus 22. Love these shoes. I have these shoes. Uh, um, they're like the best shoes for walking and staying on your feet. Okay, so Brooks Diod, Brooks Ravenna, New Balance 840, and the Saucony Echelon are also good for the average arch. Now, if you have flat feet or low arch, um, the A6 Kayanos are probably the shoe to go to with. So here's the A6 Kayano 26. Love these shoes for anybody that has uh, flat feet. Um, Brooks Agellan 20, Brooks Transcend 6, and the Saucony Omni ISO work really well as well. Now, the other one, I did have these where if your your first toe, like which is your big toe, it doesn't really move too much and you like those rocker shoes, um, these are not the greatest for sports. So I <clears throat> don't really recommend these Hoka's, but the New Balance 1080 seem to be really good for overall mid-arch and limited mobility. So these are really good shoes too. Obviously, you can get them in different colors, um, black, uh, blue, red. But again, if you have low arches, um, the A6 Kayanos are hard to beat. Probably one of the best made shoes out there for uh, low arches. All right. Um, again, development of epidemic skeleton mainly by endocrinal ossification, which we talked about. Ossification not complete until the 20s. Upper limb buds, you start to get them by day 26, 27. Lower limb buds by one to two days. There, so in one month, you have your upper limbs already. So we looked at uh, Mr. Thumb Guy, right? Uh, Richard Groshen. He's a handsome man, but something went wrong between 26 and 28th day. His mom maybe didn't know he was pregnant or malnutrition or the case may be, but that's just a genetic uh, defect that occurred. Digital rays, 38 to 44. 
digits separate by apoptosis end of week eight. Okay, so the separation needs to happen in the first two months. Cartilaginous limb skeleton ends in week six. Primary ossification sites, week six. And carpal bones, cartilaginous at birth. So those car carpal bones I showed you, they're mostly cartilage. So embryo at seven weeks. Pathology, what can go wrong? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. You got amelia, complete absence of one or more limbs. Meromelia, partial absence of a limb, polydactyly, extra fingers or toes, syndactyly, which is web digits, and club feet. So here's polydactyly, extra fingers, extra fingers, and here's syndactyly, where it failed to separate. So this individual had both, and it fails, so they'll have to separate there. And then... Again, here's polydactyly, but here's club foot that can occur as well. And you might have to put braces for this. Club foot is common deformity at the ankle and foot that is present at birth. Most cases are corrected without surgery and affected individuals will grow up to lead normal active lives. But poor little guy was squished in that little sp space for nine months. Okay. There you go.